Good evening, and thank you for taking a few minutes of your busy time to spend with me as we look into God's Word. Just considering, well, our times are busy, our lives are busy, but if we're too busy to get into the Word of God, then we really are too busy. Nevertheless, I know that we have a lot of things crowding in on our lives, a lot of responsibilities, a lot of duties, and sometimes a lot of interests. So thank you for taking the time to share these times of studying God's Word together. We're looking this evening at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, and I've entitled this study, What Metric Defines You? What Metric Defines You? Now, before we get into the actual text, before we look at the scriptures, we are going to take a minute to pray. Let's do that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we can spend in your word. We look to you and to the Holy Spirit to guide us and to help us to understand what the word of God says so that we can apply the word of God to our lives. Help us in both these aspects, Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, before we go into the text itself, into the gospel message, let's uh, have an opportunity to listen to the worship team as they share a beautiful video with us, a song that they recorded during one of our um, our worship evenings and we of course we have worship evenings from time to time and we always invite you to join us it's also always a wonderful opportunity our worship team now there's joy in the house of the lord clap with us Joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. 
earth, we shout out his praise. We give glory and praise to the Lord, our God, our Savior, Jesus. Let's look now at the text that is before us. The text is from 2 Timothy, the third chapter, and we're looking at verses 10 and, and, and 11. Uh, as Paul writes, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. There's a term or an idea that some of you may be familiar with. It's called the third metric. Now, the third metric is, is a way of measuring life and measuring success beyond the typical metrics that we use today of how much money we may have or how much power we may wield. This third metric includes such things as well-being, uh, wonder, wisdom, and giving, according to some authorities or some authors. But I would also include such things as purposefulness and integrity. Purposefulness and integrity. When we read this passage here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's clear that uh, such things as purposefulness and integrity, um, intentionality, are all included in Paul's ideas, as Paul is actually suggesting to Timothy that Timothy establish a metric for, for his life that is different from the typical one of his surrounding world. And of course, at the same time, Paul is making, making it clear to Timothy that he measured success by a metric unlike the one used by the world. Now, as I read this passage, just these two verses, in fact, I'm immediately prompted to, to be very uh, introspective. I cannot help but to ask myself if I would have such confidence in the way that I have lived, my, lived out my faith that I would feel comfortable in pointing others to me as an example to be followed. That's what Paul is doing. What about you? The apostle writes with, 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 with certain, a certain assurance that Timothy has full knowledge and accurate information and accurate understanding of both his, Paul's character and his conduct. That's what he means by stating that Timothy has followed his, his teaching, his conduct, and his aim in life. Let's look at those again. He says, uh, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my, my aim in life, my, pa my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Then he goes on about my persecutions and my sufferings. But you, Paul, Paul is confident. He's assured. He knows that, that Timothy knows how he's lived. Timothy has evidence. And so Timothy has followed Paul's teaching. He's followed Paul's conduct. He's followed uh, Paul's aim in life. Uh, he's followed Paul, Paul's patience and his love and his, uh, uh, his steadfastness. As well, of course, as he knows well about Paul's persecutions and sufferings. These are the components of Paul's third metric. These are the things that Paul is listing as the, the measure of his life. In a sense, what Paul has stated to Timothy is that his entire life was an open book to all. What was obvious to Timothy would have been obvious to all others who had a close connection, a close relationship with Paul. But he's also intimating that he lived his life with intentionality once he became a follower of Jesus. 
I think that it's safe to state that a great number of people live their lives haphazardly or casually, at the very least. And yet they expect to arrive at, that, at the same destination with the same results as those persons who live purposefully. Now, let's take what Paul has written in verse 10 as a paradigm for living a purposeful and successful life and see what we can harvest from that text. Now, what I'm going to suggest that we do in order for us to, to really get the, the full meat from this text, as it were, uh, I, I suggest that what we need to do is reverse the order and consider the, the text, looking at the thing that Paul states last, looking at that first, all the way in a reverse order back to what he states first and keeping that one last. Why? I think you should understand, would understand the reason for my suggestion. It's because what Paul taught and how he conducted his life were the fruit of his, uh, of his inner life, his character. So let's look at the first thing that Paul mentions, his steadfastness. That's the last quality in that list. In the original text, it is a word that is sometimes translated patience or perseverance. And according to New Testament scholar, New Testament Greek scholars, it refers to endurance in the face of difficult things or difficult circumstances. Now remember that distinction, because there's another word that shows up later on that has to do with patience too, or perseverance or steadfastness, but it's different. Here, this word steadfastness, patience, perseverance, um, it's, it's that endurance in the face of difficult circumstances, in the face of difficult things. As we know from reading Paul's life, reading about, his Paul's, about Paul's life, he most certainly experienced difficulties that would have tested his resolve to keep on doing what Christ had commissioned him to do. His multiple beatings and shipwrecks are just examples of this, as well as, of course, his stoning and his imprisonment. Yes, there is clear evidence of patient endurance on his part. The next word, remember we're looking at them in the reverse order, is the word love. And now this is the word agape in the Greek, a word I'm sure that you're familiar with, uh, although many of us pronounce it agape. Uh, this is the kind of love that is extolled by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're familiar with that. Though I speak with the tongues of men, of angels, and I have not charity, King James Virgin says, or love, agape. It is the kind of love that that goes beyond feelings. It goes beyond emotions. It's the kind of affection that does not depend on circumstances or really the deservedness of the one that is being loved. Of course, this is far easier to write about and, and to talk about than actually practice or to live out. Perhaps I think the reality might be that only God himself is capable of practicing this kind of love, this agape love. And yes, it is a practice. It's not just a feeling. Although there are clear emotions involved, God's love for us is not an emotionless love, but unlike our love, his love is constant. His love is unwavering. His love is disconnected, disassociated from our faults and from our failures and from our flaws. He loves us in a sense in spite of who we are and what we've done. What we have to note, however, is that Paul's steadfastness or Paul's perseverance in the face of difficult things and circumstances, these are rooted in his love for God and his love for those he sought to win to Christ. Steadfastness, perseverance, mm -hmm, dealing with difficult circumstances and the lack of things or things going the wrong way. He continued to do what he had been commissioned to do because of his love for God and his love 
for those that God had sent him to share this gospel with. The next word based on the ESV is the word patience, rendered as long-suffering in the good old King James Version. The original Greek word is makrotumea, and it does mean patience, but, but more along the line I mentioned before to pay attention, because we have more than one word that has this same idea of patience, but with a slight different distinction. It means patience. This makrotumea means patience but more along the line of patience in respect to dealing with people, with persons, especially difficulties with persons, or shall we say, even difficult persons. You know, the reality is, in life, whether it's in church or out of church, the things that sometimes make it more difficult for us to keep on doing what God has called us to do, may not be difficult circumstances, but it may be difficulties with people, people who also claim to be believers, people who also claim to profess Christ. And those difficulties can sometimes derail us and cause us to, to lose our focus on the purpose for which God has called us. Now, I love the the Greek New Testament. I, I suppose one of the contributions of the Greek language, uh, the, um, and this is one of the things, is the manner in which subtle distinctions are made in, in communication by, by, by having distinct words that define these very fine distinctions. So, so we need a different kind of patience, for example, when we're dealing with troublesome people from the type of patience that we need when we're dealing with troublesome circumstances or trouble with things. But again, at the heart of this ability to endure difficulties with people, and I think we could see that much more clearly than the previous one, is love. Maybe when we're talking about the first one, the steadfastness, you know, and steadfastness, love and patience. When we talk about steadfastness, it may be here that, that what holds us on course is our love for God. Our love for God. Despite what happens. In this case, when it comes to um, this word that is patience, uh, dealing with the difficulties, the grace of God that needs to be developed in us to help us to love not only God, but to love the people that are giving us <clears throat> difficulties. The people that get under, or somebody said, our last good nerve. To love them. Yes, I think Paul at this point in his life could recognize that the grace of God had developed in him these qualities, steadfastness, love, and patience. But then there was also faith. Like love, Faith, faith is a quality that requires an object. We don't just love, we love people or things. We don't just have faith, we have faith in people or, or things. We don't just love, we love people or things, as we said, and we don't just have faith in faith itself, we have faith in people or we have faith in things, that those things are gonna work and they're good for us or whatever the case. The object of faith into which Paul was referring without actually stating it, of course, is the person of God. The idea, of course, is trust and confidence in the character and nature of God, as well as trust in the actions of God. Believing and trusting that God is good and God's heart towards us is always for our good. And knowing and, and trusting, having confidence in God's nature and God's character. And of course, in God's actions, such as the action of Jesus going to the cross on our behalf. I like the quality of love, faith is essential to the development and the maintenance of, of such attributes as patience and perseverance. Love and faith are core spiritual qualities. Without these nothing of spiritual value is able to develop. 
in a sense, they are the soil for all of the other fruit of the Spirit. Next, we have the words aim in life, a phrase that is based on one single Greek word and which is translated as purpose in the King James Version and also translated as purpose in other passages of Scripture, including this translation. The original Greek word seems to refer more to to attributes that are attitudes and actions. These attributes, where they're attitudes or actions, they are cultivated and they are maintained with a particular outcome in mind. We see such uh, an idea in in, in verses such as Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. In, In Romans 8, 28, we read, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And that purpose, according to verse 29, tells us that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And so what Paul is telling us, that God is a purposeful God, And God is working out for our good everything that happens in our lives. The good, the bad, the indifferent, so to speak. Those things are being worked together by God for our good. Because we have been called according to God's purpose. And that purpose is stated there in verse 29. What was it? Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I think the point is clear. Paul was intentional and purposeful in his life as a follower of Christ. He knew what kind of person he had been. He knew what Christ had done to transform his life and his destiny. And he also knew and kept close to his heart that call and that commission that he had received from Jesus Christ at the time of his conversion. These certainties positioned Paul to to live a life dedicated to spreading the gospel, especially to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. And so his aim in life then, his purpose, was to be true to the calling he had received from Jesus Christ. That, That was what he was persuaded to do and keep on doing. In which brings us now to the penultimate word in this list as we look at them in the reverse order of the original list. It's the word conduct. Paul's conduct was determined by his purpose, right? His conduct was determined by his purpose. When his purpose was based on his faith in Christ, And that faith or confident assurance produced the patient endurance that caused him to endure opposition from others and which faith and patience were rooted in his love for God and for people, all of which converged to produce the steadfastness in times of difficulty that we see so evident in Paul's life. So, brothers and sisters, I think as we read the text, we read... We need not speculate on what would have been the content of Paul's teaching. So the last thing his list is teaching in, as we go in reverse order, what would have been the content of his teaching? Paul's teaching, which, which makes up nearly half of the New Testament in his various letters. And if we add what we find in the book of Acts, well, actually it's half the New Testament. His teaching is nothing more than an expression of his life as a believer. The message of grace that he taught was based on the grace that he had received and that was working in his life, had worked transformation in his life and was continuing to work transformation in his life. In times of difficulty, when he cried out to God to take away this thorn in the flesh, He learned something about grace and he could pass that on to us. He was the, in a sense, uh, God's workshop or God's lab, laboratory, 
And he could say, out of these things, I've learned this about my God, and I'm passing these things on to you. I'm teaching you, not from theory, but from experience. So we don't need to speculate about Paul's teaching. We have it right there in Scripture. But we would notice that that his, his teaching seems to us, from what we can see, to be very consistent with his conduct or his conduct very consistent with his teaching. And so the message of grace that Paul taught was based on grace that Paul had received. Grace that was working, had worked transformation and was continuing to work transformation in his life. And of course, this was the grace that operated in his life and enabled him to not only endure, but to endure with courage and endure with um, undimmed faith in the various as he says, persecutions and sufferings that he points to in verse 11. And so, as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, these spiritual qualities in these two verses, these are the metric that defined the Apostle Paul. If you want to talk about a third metric, from a Christian perspective, it needs to be things such as these. My question, my brother and sister, is what metric defines you? Is it still material success and prosperity and fame and uh, being licked up to praise, adored, uh, becoming the hero that everyone worships? Or in other words, uh, Is it a metric given to you by the world or a metric given to you by God? May God help us to have a unique third metric, but one that's unique because we didn't make it up. It's one given to us by God himself. Thank God for the opportunity to be able to share this word with you this evening. Well, as we close, let's take time to offer a prayer for the persecuted church. My understanding from reading recently again is that in the last century and the and coming in, that is the 20th century, and here in the 21st century, more Christians have been martyred, more people have been martyred for their faith in Christ than all of the combined centuries, all, yes, all the centuries from the beginning of Christianity up until the 20th century. And the martyrdom continues, the persecutions continue. Please don't forget to pray for the persecuted church our brothers and sisters. Father, in Christ's name, we take time now to remember that we are part of the body of Christ. Many of us listening, watching, are living in places where persecution is not even a thought that crosses our mind. But Lord, as the times move forward and as prophecy is fulfilled, persecution will come our way in extreme measures as well. And so we pray that you would be with us and help us to dig deep and to grow deep in our faith, to be strengthened by your grace in our own commitment to you. We pray for the suffering, persecuted church, that you would bless and strengthen our brothers and sisters, that they will, instead of even wavering in their faith, They would walk in, in a sense, walk into those arenas knowing that, yes, suffering will come, but after that, there is the presence of the Lord. Strengthen them, Lord, wherever they are suffering today for your name, that their lives would become, the the blood of the saints would continue to be the seed of the church. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I think it'll be useful for us to remember the, the goodness and the favor of God. And so let's just uh, hit this song. And we've heard it before, and we've heard it many times, but we'll hear it again. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Clap with us.